from family events to volunteer opportunities to community happenings, there is a lot going on in your community. Learn about all the possibilities and opportunities on this episode of Community Hotline. Hi, I'm Curtis Atino, and I'm in for Monica Weitzel today for Community Hotline. Our first guests this afternoon are Huey Ong and Fipe Havea from Apano, the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah, thank, thank you, Curtis. Why don't we start off with you telling us a little bit about the organization, a little background. Um, so, um, Apano, the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, was first established back in the 90s. Um, uh, it was API elders within the community, and so... Um, Can you explain API? API um, is an acronym for Asian Pacific Islanders, okay. and so I'll be referring to that throughout the, okay. so the time. Sure. Yeah. There's so much lingo. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so it was established back in the 90s, um, Asian Pacific Islander elders, and so um, due to lack of activity and involvement, um, it just kind of phased out. And then back in 2008, um, that's when Apano revived again, and it has... Um, Recently, back in 2011, um, received a uh, 501c3 status as a nonprofit organization, and um, so we've just recently, about two, a little two over, a uh, little over two years, um, as a nonprofit organization. And what does that status gain you exactly? Um, and so, um, I think one of the great things about Apano, kind of the opportunities and kind of why the need for this coalition, mm -hmm. uh, kind of grow is, you know, as. Asian Pacific Islanders were actually one of the fastest growing populations in Oregon. And you know, we saw that there was a need for our voices to be heard. And so Apano is a statewide organization to really engage a multi-ethnic as well as a multi-generational um, community in you know, the electoral process, in the political process, and really to amplify our voices together. Because I think you know, when you talk about Asian Americans, there's actually a pretty broad Mm -hmm. uh, multilingual, multi-ethnic uh, community. So how do we see some of our self-interest in you know, building out a coalition together? But then also, like, what are some of the differences and some of the challenges in you know, how do we develop you know, leaders and grassroots you know, voices in you know, our decision and political processes? Okay. So. Well, so speaking of politics, then back in the fall, you guys did something unique. You had a, a multilingual phone bank. You want to talk about that a little bit? That sounds kind of cool. Yeah, so um, so we've held, um, like what you said, a unique multilingual phone bank, and um, we've had um, over 100 volunteers um, volunteering um, over 100 shifts, of course, and we've had um, over 10 languages spoken at each shift. And um, to support our volunteers, we even um, translated voter guides in um, over seven, langu seven different languages. Um, we've also, part of our Get Out the Vote campaign, we've also um, distributed those voter guides to different API uh, small local businesses. And, um, and, so, um, and so, yeah, and so we've reached how many voters? I actually don't know the numbers, but... You can make up a number. It's yeah, it's, 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 it's totally <laughs> fine. But um, I think our electoral work and our get out the vote work, I think everyone is doing something in a presidential mm -hmm. election, but I think one of our uniqueness was our multilingual phone banks where people were reached out to in their native language, which I think is very rare. Um, for some of these communities to actually hear their native language spoken about politics. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we thought it was very important to engage and, and do that level of outreach. Um, but that's, you know, for us to build up, you know, our, communi our communication and our, our contacts to these different communities. Uh, we actually even got an opportunity to do voter registration at uh, the swearing-in ceremonies for new citizens, which is oh, great. very exciting mm -hmm. for us to, you know, be there when folks are, you know, getting their citizenship and, and registering them and, you know, getting them involved later on. Is, is 10 languages enough to, to cover? Not even close no. to the <laughs> not languages that are out there, for no. sure. Yeah. And, you know, the, the populations and the communities that are growing in Oregon are, you know, uh, I think lots of communities that people might not even have heard of. And, you know, there's Bhutanese growing population, Nepalese. Um, you know, so those are like other ethnic communities that I think oftentimes goes beyond just the kind of mainstream Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, Japanese kind of 
three prong mm -hmm. uh, API uh, images. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really good to provide that space for these smaller communities to come out and have an amplified voice. Okay, so it's kind of a start then, and perhaps sure. at least uh, people who weren't able to be heard or connect before, mm -hmm. you were able to reach them for the election, getting, getting out the vote with that intent. And so now coming into 2013, you've made connections with these people in the fall, and you're going to roll that into some further activities. What's going on then? Yeah. Um, so we've uh, hosted um, numbers of policy forums, and so... Um, so we've had a couple back in um, November, December, and just recently, this past Saturday, we've held a policy forum in Salem. And um, our upcoming policy forum will be held uh, the 31st of this month um, in Eugene. Um, so that's targeting the, the Lane County um, community. And so, um, and so, yeah, so with these policy forums, we, it's basically to um, open up a space and provide um, an opportunity for the API um, communities to come together and discuss policy issues that affect um, our communities directly, um, whether it's tuition equity or if it's um, um, earned sick days or the driver's license restoration um, policy. And so, um, so uh, what they're so, oh, sorry, one sec. So, uh, earned sick days. How would that be different? How, how, how is that an issue? Maybe I could maybe step back just a, a, a little step and talk about the fact that you know, we did all this electoral work and mm -hmm. engage people in the voter process, but also a lot of our communities aren't um, you know, able to actually be registered voters, but they, their voices are still needed to be heard because they're Oregonians, they're part of this community. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's lots of different issues people could take on, and you know, we know that there's lots of different things in the API community could take on. We decided you know, for 20, 2013 to really focus on two main areas. One, uh, around health equity really looking at the health disparities that are out there that impacts our communities and, you know, really think about very specific ways to, you know, address change. Um, so I think the paid sick days is one of those, you know, places where how do okay. we think about economic justice as well as, you know, thinking of uh, the API voice in that particular strategy. A lot of them are, you know, small business owners and how would they be impacted, but also the benefits of, you know, not having folks go to, go to work sick and, and, you know, engage you know, their customers and getting them sick. You know, it's actually a, a pretty mm -hmm. important issue. And kind of the other main, you know, kind of focus for us is uh, educational access. Um, mm -hmm. For a lot of English language learners, uh, ELL, we call the, these communities, there's actually been a lot of disparities in our, in our school systems and how do we actually amplify the voice of parents and API parents in particular in these spaces so that you know, the funding actually matches the programs and, you know, oftentimes when it's, you know, tough budget uh, situations, our communities are often the ones first on the chopping blocks because they don't have that political voice, right? Okay. So a big part of Apano's reason to engage in uh, the, these areas of work is because it directly impacts both our families, our children, and their educational access as well as the health that they're able to receive. Okay, great. And so the, uh, the forums then are an opportunity to basically get to the details of some of the stuff that you're, you're interested in or trying to affect. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the cool things about the forums is it provides a space where we're not just telling people what the issues are out there. It's actually an opportunity to engage with communities around their own personal histories, right? You know, we're not paid lobbyists as an organization. All of us are mm -hmm. mostly volunteers. Uh, we have a small staff, but uh, that, just, that helps us coordinate. But, you know, it, it provides a space for um, our own expertise to come out, right? Because we are directly affected by the issues and being mm -hmm. able to hear those stories are pretty important for us. Uh, so the forum provides that space, but then it's not just a place to vent, right? We actually do want people to take and take steps and action. So we want to engage in the political process, both locally uh, in our different city councils, but then also on a statewide level uh, at the Capitol. So it, that, that, that you know, our forums leads into that level of work. And has this been, is this primarily a Portland What's your, what's your community, I guess? Yeah. I mean, there's a huge concentration of APIs in general. So in, in the metro area, so for sure, we have a, a bigger population of activists and members here. Mm -hmm. But we have expanded and grown. We actually do want to have a statewide focus. And uh, there's actually pockets of communities in Eugene and into Ashland and, um, and even into the Salem area. Uh, so it's nice to be able to do that <coughs> level of outreach. And we actually try to identify regionally how we put these forums together so there actually will be a forum in Eugene, you know, central for some other folks to be able to uh, participate. But so far the forums have just been right here in Portland. No, we've had other oh. ones and we've done our electoral work also, you know, statewide um, out of Eugene as well as in Salem as well as in Portland and kind of this area, Beaverton. Metro area, Beaverton. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, anything else you want to say about the, the policy forms that are coming up? Um, no. Okay. Yeah. So it's an exciting opportunity for hosts to get involved. Yeah. Um, so how would somebody find out about attending or participating in, in one of the, the forums? Uh, so, um, so folks can visit our website um, at uh, www.apano.org and um, we'll have information of uh, location, um, time, and, and whatnot um, about our upcoming last policy forum, which will be the 31st of this month in Eugene. And um, I know for Portlanders who would want to attend is, is a bit of a commute, but those who are in the Eugene area would, um, are more than welcome to attend. And, um, and one that's actually coming up even a little bit sooner is on February 16th in the Portland Community College Southeast Branch. Uh, we will have our State of Cultural Competency Forum where we're going to talk a little bit about uh, particularly the health equity issues. And, you know, it's a pretty sizable uh, group of folks that come together and, and, you know, listen to kind of where we're at on the issue, but also ways to in be involved uh, coming, moving mm -hmm. forward in 2013. Is that the 82nd and Foster? Yeah, it's, okay. yes. right. it's a great space. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's nice that they converted that into something useful there. <laughs> um, you want to talk a little bit about the legislative agenda that you have? Yeah, I think it. You know, what we want to do is actually build out a grassroots base of folks being able to be engaged in a political process. Um, so to actually be in Salem, to be in the city council, and as we know, like, there's you know, tons of bills that will come through. So we work in coalition with a lot of different organizations to both track good bills and actually weigh in on good bills, but then also to think about you know, the impact of some bad bills that people might not know uh, about and en engage our members around. Some of the key um, legislative <coughs> issues are we really want to move forth a uniform data collection uh, standard for race, ethnicity, and the language. Um, we actually have a bill mm -hmm. uh, in the state legislature, and we'll be moving that. Um, what, what does that mean exactly? It's pretty important for us to, in terms of servicing uh, our different communities, right? we're pretty diverse uh, as an API community, and if we are able to understand our data and how do we collect data in terms of you know, ethnic, ethnic backgrounds, um, it, it helps us sharpen how we provide services as a, as a state. Uh, this is very important in the health area, in health you know, services, mm -hmm. but also in like, areas of education. Um, knowing just the demographics of you know the communities we want to be serving. So getting a clearer picture of, of yeah, absolutely. Okay. I just think it's a it's a smart move, right, for okay. our okay. state to be involved in. Um, there's you know other issues. You know we definitely want to uh, work to you know uh, the fluoridation of you know, Portland's water system, and uh, it's pretty important for the API communities. There's definitely data out there that connects um, oral health uh, with fluoridization. And particularly for low income and people of color communities. So, we definitely want to see that through, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for the Portland metro area. And there's a lot of other different bills, I won't get into it, but there's opportunities for folks to learn about the different issues. Um, you know, we also are talking about looking at the budget and making sure that, you know, the programs that are uh, supporting the English language learners in our schools aren't on the chopping block. And there's transparency behind the budget process around, you know, what's being weighed against other programs. Um, you know, we work in coalition because we feel it's important that we have a united voice, not just within the API community, but also other communities that uh, oftentimes are on the chopping block as well. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, our budgets are tight for sure, and being able to have an opportunity to weigh in and, and have people really rethink their priorities in Salem is important for our families and uh, our communities to speak up. Just to be visible. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, just to uh, back that up, um, we also have a ledge day coming up, um, and so for folks sorry, to what day? a legislative day. Okay. Sorry, I just it was, yeah, but um, okay. yeah. So it's a legislative day uh, coming up uh, April seventeenth. So it's actually the day after the State of Cultural Competency Forum, and that'll be at eight a.m. Where um, folks, volunteers, and those who are interested in um, attending with um, Apano um, will head down to Salem and um, do all the work that um, Hui had just explained. Okay. So, so yeah. Are you gonna be driving everybody? We actually yeah. were in a bus. Yeah, we're in a bus. Yeah, yeah, we're because, bus. You know, we, access to Salem is not easy oftentimes. Some of our folks mm -hmm. are local commuters. Uh, some actually don't drive, mm -hmm. uh, both elders and, and, and youth that we want to engage in this process. And it's kind of nice. We actually have our, like, Apano shirts, and we kind of yeah. take over the Capitol. And, shirts. Uh, it's really <laughs> nice to engage, you know, our elected officials who, you know, actually appreciate the voices uh, that we bring to the table. Because oftentimes, you know, they kind of see the same lobbyists a lot, and we provide a different, hopefully, voice, mm -hmm. um, you know, to their space, and you know, share different stories and the impact you know that their their decisions have on our communities, 
it's important to hear from their constituencies. That's great. And, and what does someone have to do to get a t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can definitely work through the website mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually order one, I think, through our website. Yeah, uh, sure. Just as long as you want to. We'll get you one, Curtis, yeah, Okay, yeah, I do need one. I look great in red. <laughs> yeah, great in red, I imagine so, for sure. Well, uh, is there anything else you guys want to talk about? We just have a couple seconds left, but I feel like we've hit all the points and have a good, clear picture of what you guys are hoping to do. And we're really excited for uh, the opportunity to continue mm -hmm. to work with you know, this, this television program. It's great to great. have access here. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you again. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming yeah, in, you guys. Uh, please stay tuned for our next guest, and we'll be going to a break just about now. Thanks so much. Real cool, Curtis. That was fun. Oh, good job, you guys. Yeah. are the cornerstone of local communities and they enjoy the satisfaction that comes from being part of something larger than themselves. Multnomah County invites citizens to participate in projects that benefit the greater good of our residents. Want to help homeless animals? There are countless volunteer opportunities with Multnomah County Animal Services. There's always a lot to do when caring for almost 10,000 animals a year. Our shelter is at the forefront of animal care with some of the most progressive programs in the nation, and we depend on volunteers to keep those programs running. From showing cats to potential owners, to training dogs in the shelter, to fostering a shelter pet in your home, you can help your community by volunteering your time and talents with animal services. To find out more about this volunteer opportunity, visit their website. To explore other volunteer opportunities, contact the Office of Citizen Involvement. Shape your community. Volunteer. KZME Radio is a new station that is committed to entertain, inspire, and connect our community through programming that celebrates local music, arts, and culture. It was created to put local music and local arts on local radio, and it is a vehicle for our creative community to gain exposure while also celebrating what the Portland metro area has to offer. Hey folks, I'm Mike Midlow from the band Pancake Breakfast. What's so cool about KZME? Well, it's local music. You know, you can't go to every live show. Believe me, I've tried. So you can tune into KZME and hear a bunch of music that you might not get to see otherwise. Why should you support KZME? Well, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if you like Portland Town, USA, homegrown music, independent radio, and if you believe in the powers of rock and roll, then contribute to KZME. It's music where you live. My favorite thing about community media is how people find their voice and tell their story. It's the message of, by, and for a community. We're a gathering place because it gets people of all sorts of different backgrounds underneath one roof. It's art. It's technology. A snapshot of our community. Going live in three, two, one. The League of Women Voters makes history. Our country would not be the same without their dedication. Formed by women who organized to win women the right to vote. It is now a co-ed organization. Studying, informing, and acting. Nonpartisan. Grassroots. Influential. Taking political stands on many issues. The League of Women Voters encourages all citizens to be informed and active in government. Join, Join the, the League, League of Women, Women Voters, Voters of East Multnomah County, County in, in making history, history today. today.
Welcome back. This is Curtis Atino with Community Hotline, and my next guest is Dean Johnston with the Toy Enjoy Makers organization. How's it going? Pretty good. Welcome. Thank you. What do you want to talk about? Well, let's talk about kids and toys. Okay. Tell me, tell me something about the organization, please. Well, Toy Enjoy Makers is part of the Portland Fire Bureau. It has been since 1914. Kind of started with a fire station in Selwood. A little boy wanted a so wagon fix for the, his little brother for Christmas. And it kind of went from that one toy to well over 75,000 toys now. How many? 75,000. We help out, just in December, almost 3,000 families and over 12,000 children. It takes a lot of toys. Yeah. And when you give three or four items per child, you, know, you can just see the numbers. So you have to have space and time. And, but it's a very, very rewarding program for us. And uh, there were a whole bunch of volunteers, mm -hmm. probably about 20 volunteers a day, a day there, starting just after Thanksgiving. And they'll push out 150 families worth of toys six days a week. So, so who needs the toys exactly? Well, it's always families in need. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, the program kind of works around with the community and we have a clearing bureau, so we, we help out as many families as we can, not have any duplications. But it's low-income families. We kind of all go by income from the federal guidelines and if there's guidelines a little above that there's always situations we talk to but we do need to talk to legal guardians we want to help out the parent that has a child at that through that time and, and we just want to be able to help out the family maybe they have a little better time at Christmas having a toy you know toys are not as important as food or clothing or housing but toys are kind of nice for the children they make them feel a little better and the parents feel a little better about giving it to their children They'll have a better year this next year that comes along. And so the, uh, talk about the, uh, how, do, how would a kid qualify for the program? Well, for us, you need to live, live in the city of Portland. Okay. And a legal guardian needs to call us. And we have a call center. And they're right there with the computer, so they do all the input in the computer right away. Mm -hmm. So we know if this Volunteers of America or Snowcap or Toy Enjoy is helping out that family. And then they're given a time to pick up. We uh, hardly have any deliveries. We used to deliver quite a bit. And we did, you know, 500 families, but when you do almost 3,000, it takes a long, long time to get that done, so. Right. But it's kind of important, you know, it's, it's a great time of year for us to get some publicity for the program, to have the public donate toys, uh, bring them to the fire stations or bring them to the Safeways or different districts where you have different banks or wherever they have toy collection spots. And then we get together a lot and we sort them out by age groups. We still keep the age groups separate. Because toys are appropriate age group, mm -hmm. partly because something might be dangerous, you know, too small for younger Choking kids. Choking hazards. Choking hazards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're not too sure if it says for three-year-olds plus, it's not really appropriate for a 12-year-old, maybe. Usually. Yeah, usually. But we, we do that. Uh, you know, we have, like I say, almost about 18 to 20 volunteers there every day. And I get to kind of figure out different hours and it says you're looking, you know, 5,000 hours, you know. 26,000 miles in volunteer driving just to make a program work. But if you don't have the volunteers, there's very few programs that will work because there's, there's no money out there. Yeah. You know, uh, we work throughout the year, off season, trying to raise some money to buy toys that we can get a good deal on. You know, because I'd love to buy, you know, five cents on a dollar. Uh, I don't need to go to a toy store in December where they're trying to make all their money to make the living for their employees and themselves mm -hmm. and get, you know, 10% off or 15 cent off coupon on a Sunday paper. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather save, you know, I'd rather spend $30,000 for $100,000 worth of toys. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what is the ratio between donations and, and actual purchases that you can make? We, we get donations from the public mm -hmm. and businesses, so it's almost about 65%. Okay. And the rest will buy. Uh, and like I say, we get a pretty good deal. Uh, and we have some toys. You know, we probably have toys for certain age groups for two or three years because there's a lot of them. What do you mean exactly? Well, you can take boys, you know, five to eight. Mm -hmm. There's hundreds and thousands of toys out there for that age group. Oh, so that particular market is yeah, glutted. Yeah, it's really good. Okay. You have a little trouble with the younger ones and the older ones. Uh, you know, we have to kind of pick and choose about what we can give out. Uh, you know, just we try to give out just toys because we don't know about you know makeup, hairstyles. We don't do clothing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so you're kind of limited sometimes. But the nice thing about computers now, 
you know, we, we, well, somebody can help me, go online, and we have a wholesaler online now. Or we used to have to go to, the, go to the wholesaler, figure out everything else, you know, figure out how to ship it, what to get. Now it's just click on the buttons. If they, they say they have it, fine. If they're short of it, and you go to something else. But uh, what used to take you a couple of days now takes you an hour. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we help out throughout the year through uh, natural disasters, unfortunately. You know, you have some fire families that have a fire or some tragedy in their house that where they have to move. You always have help for the housing and clothing and food. But in case of fire or things like that, usually the toys don't go with them. All right, so it's not just a Christmas thing. No, not it's just Christmas. All year long, well, if, if, if there's a situation where a family... Sure. Yeah, and, and times we get calls from the police bureau where they've had to remove a fam mother and their kids from a situation, and you know they get them someplace safe. And you know we have no cares where they are, what their income is, or anything. If the children didn't get to take toys with them, we try to get. And our shelves are set up all year long. It's like a toy store, and mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons, so that we know if we have a fire or we have a domestic thing or a flood or something that where we can go to that. You know, shelving up there and pick up enough toys for a little while rather than going through a whole warehouse and moving, you know, 10 cases trying to figure out what's in it. Right. So, uh, so is this in the fire department exactly, or do you have your own separate? Well, we have our own building. Okay. Uh, you know, we're kind of pretty well tied with the fire bureau, you know, and uh, we kind of like their uniforms and their red rigs and, and all the help they give. And the big yeah. shiny loud yeah, sirens and lights. lights. Yeah, you know, I mean, Santa Claus got a red suit, you know, red fire rig. That's a, <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Same thing. Well, we have a lot of businesses in Portland area that have toy collection boxes and they mm -hmm. collect toys. And, and you know, we always try to say businesses have this white gift thing at Christmas time or something like that. We say, why don't you buy a gift for a child and put it in a box there and we'll come pick it up. Or, uh, it's, you know, we went to almost 90 different businesses just in December to collections. And then we go out and we give about 15 talks at different businesses that you know, will give us money and toys. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the families in need that we help that we, you know, want to feel good about. We feel good about the businesses and the community in, in Portland and the Portland area that want to give to programs like the Toy Joy Makers uh, so they can help those kids. All right, so engaging them in yeah. some philanthropy. Because I always tell them, it says, you know, that smile on your face is renewable. <laughs> you know, you can, give, you can give us the toys on a Saturday night at the Christmas party you had, and it would be a week before Christmas. But some will have a smile of toys for Christmas and because of what you give. So it takes a lot of work, a lot of hours. Uh, you think you're a good shopper for toys. You get something for a little girl that's seven years old and you try to figure out, well, what's the appropriate toy for her? You know, and we try to give each child in that age group a book that doesn't count as one of the toys either. We think reading and education is very important. Yeah. And maybe the family will read together and do a little better. And so... Uh, Someone will ask for a very specific thing. Then say, "I have a, a girl who's this age, and she wants such and such." And yeah. you can sometimes you can sort of not, cater. That not very thing. often. Not okay. very often. It's more general. Yeah, we try to we, we do age appropriate toys. Okay. And we're not trying to fulfill the needs for anything. We're just trying to fill the needs for that age group. So maybe you could have a you know a game over here and a doll over here and a basketball over here and a soccer ball over here and you know a truck and craft items it just kind of depends okay uh, there's a lot of stuff out there for crafts and there's a lot of stuff out there just for toys and I was intrigued uh, you mentioned earlier about the fact that uh, you used to do a lot of repairs on the toys yeah. back in the day yeah. which we'll call the 70s oh well you started repairing toys when we started this program in 1914 they repaired fire stations just spread all over and they're repairing toys you know even in my era mm -hmm. the, the 70s today you know engine we had engine six that would take care of the trains. We, he'd give train, give out trains, so they had to make sure the trains were all together and all worked. And engine thirteen there at Lloyd Center, they would do bikes and trikes, and and engine and uh, engine ten would do hobby horses. And we even had a, a, such a great group of, of 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 women in the Portland area, very good sewers, love to give something back to the community. Would make doll clothes because mm -hmm. we get a lot of dolls in that didn't have very good clothes like that, and the. Uh, these later were written. Well, now we have a group that does doll beds, blankets for the beds, or else blankets for the kids. And they just they have that skill. That's so they're still kind of repairing, but they're doing new. But we can't repair plastic anymore. Yeah. You know we don't have the time or the effort or the skills 
to fix plastic toys or electronics. If they keep getting cheaper, though, we could just buy new. <laughs> <laughs> so the stuff that comes in that isn't in uh, brand new condition, um, what, what happens to some? We have several outlets. Depends really what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, some unfortunately you do just have to throw away. Uh, others that go to some other agencies, you know, off season. We even have some of the crews that are retired that go down out and maybe they'll vacation in Mexico or Canada or someplace up there and they'll take some up there to, and the kids, some of them that have nothing there says they have no cares about Christmas at that time or they just kind of nicely have something to play with, mm -hmm. to spend their time and enjoy it and, and just, you know, not throwing rocks at a telephone pole. <laughs> Which is a good game, <laughs> yeah. but it, yeah. the toy is maybe better. Yeah. Uh, what is, tell me like, what is the craziest toy someone's ever thrown in one of those boxes? Well, probably that was donated to us. Yeah. Uh, probably the craziest thing ever that donated to us. We had a, had a guy come in, an old guy, you know, probably in his seventies, you know, really old guy. I'm getting there. So. Careful. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, he brought this train set in, complete train set that his, he had for his, I don't know, his grandfather or something like that, and wanted to give it to another child. Well, it was from the 20s. And we found out it was worth about $12,000. Yeah. So that was pr probably the, you know, the, we didn't give it out. We actually got a collector to buy it, and then we could buy a lot of toys. Uh, probably, and then the most unusual other toy was when they come out with new uh, dolls and games and toys, but they had dolls that that people thought the kids would like. And so they, you know, flooded the market. Was the, not a doll, but a toy. Like, what was the one, Tickle Me Elmo? Very popular. Yeah, nobody could get. Yeah, when they, now they're because, everywhere. Because the adults were the ones trying to buy them, not the kids. Yeah, we got one of them, and then the next year we got about a thousand of them. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one year something's unusual, next year it's just so common you gotta get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But that's a nice thing. It's really tough for kids. They'll come into the fire station, their parents will bring me in about donating toys. They'll clean out their clothes closet, I mean their toy box, so they get new toys. And it's really sometimes kind of tough where that child will give you that, want to not really give you that toy, because mm -hmm. they've had it for a while. Yeah, well, it, it's such, it means so much. Yeah, well, it's theirs. Yeah. You know, it come from their house and their toy box. And even though they may like that new one, you know, they, they kind of really like that old one too. Well, we, we usually, they usually give them to us. Do you have any toys from your childhood? Uh, no, we, I think we had toys. I think it was just dirt and rocks. Wasn't you it? didn't save any no. of it? <laughs> uh, no, I'm sure we, I mean, I, I, no, I didn't save any. Okay. You know, you have to have a big place to save all that stuff. That's true. That's true. But so, you, uh, I'm sorry. Just say, let people just, you know, throughout the years, you know, look at the programs that, that collect things and do things like that. There's. Uh, throughout the year, we you know the, the fire stations collect it, or they can call and get the information from the fire bureau. Who's picking it up? Because one of the things we need in the program is space. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have the space throughout the year to sort, figure out your organization, figure out what you need and what you're short of, it limits what you can do the next season. So, and we can't collect everything just in December. Right. You know, so think about us. Well, I liked uh, something that was mentioned on your website was this idea that if you're going to buy a gift for some for for a kid to buy two and, Absolutely. and just to kind of have that as a thought in your head as you're purchasing uh toys for children that yeah. you know while you're there if you can get yeah. get a second sure. and and so that. how would somebody reach you to, to to deliver that well probably the best way is you know they can contact the, the public number for the important fire bureau toy and joy we have a web page at toyandjoymakers.org that lists everything, how you get it. You can even donate online. It's amazing. You can it's donate money. Money? Just give Not money. Not the toys. Yeah, they can, they can donate online, but we have to go get them usually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah, it's amazing. The, the society now and the way our technology is, is we get donations online. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really helps too. You know, the, the, the bottom line is, you know, we want to help out the kids. How we help out the kids is the public, you know, and businesses and everything else choose us as an organization to help. And, and we appreciate that very much. Great. Well, thanks so much for your time. Hey, thank you. All right, we're going to go to a break right now, but please stay tuned for our next guest on Community Hotline. Thanks again. Nice job. You too.
Hi, I'm Luke Perry. You're watching Metro East. Over 25 years of great community media. Alone, our reach is limited. No matter how great our intentions, on our own, we can only stretch so far. But at Rotary, we believe the right group of people working together can make our communities, our world, a better place. Rotary, humanity in motion. Están listos? Free GED classes. Are you ready? Classes gratis de inglés. Yo estoy lista. Transportation for free. I'm ready. Classes gratis de computación. ¿Qué listos? We're, We're ready. ready. Come to listos. If you can do it, you can do it. What am I supposed to do with all these corks? Turn them into a cork board. What about all these floppy disks? How about a fantastic journal? Hmm, I wouldn't learn how to make cool things like that. Well, come on down to Scrap. Scrap has monthly workshops where you too can learn how to make great things. We provide everything you need. For more information, call 503-294-0769 or go to www.scrapaction.org. Scrap. Create more, consume less. Vienna Star was my guardian angel when my life was in shambles. They helped me find counseling and shelter. Vienna Star is great. They helped us pay our utility bills. And find health resources. I'm in college now because Vienna Star helped me find scholarships so I could put myself through school. Call 503-823-4000 to find out if Vienna Star can help you. Gracias, Vienna Star. What local community media is to us is literally our lifeline to what's going on in the lives around us. The absolute most important thing that happens in your neighborhood. People's local communities are usually what's most important to them. Because we're the faces, the smiles, the peoples, and the personalities of the community. To not only give people a voice, but to have their voice heard. Hi, Curtis Satino here for Community Hotline, sitting in for Monica Weitzel. And my last guests, guests this evening are Tim Park and Daylene Young from the Sandy Actors Theater. Welcome, you guys. Thank you very much. And we're going to talk about theater. I hope so. OK. <laughs> uh, do you want to give us a little bit of a sort of a setup for about the theater, the, the, the Sandy Actors oh, Theater. I saw that it went through some different names in its history. So Yes, it has, but uh, as far as an organization, it, we're one of the oldest community theaters in the state. We've been in operation since 1976, and we do a full season of full productions, uh, five plays, uh, usually very well-known plays. Uh, it's a uh, uh, very well attended, good patronage, uh, hilarious shows. It always helps. And so is Last Romance, your current production, hilarious? The, the next one we have, which is The Last Romance, I would say it's, it's a romantic comedy. And it is about an 80-year-old man meeting a 75-year-old woman in a dog park and what goes on as they try to communicate their differences. 
And because she's such a younger woman. Oh, yes. <laughs> They're from different cultures. Different cultures. And Daylene, you are the director of this production? I am. How's that going? How's, this, how's it going? Yeah, how's it going? <laughs> well, we're, we're right going into tech week, so it's, you know, it's, it's good, but it's, it's, your, it's your high anxiety time. Tech week is. Tech weekend, yeah. What, tell them what tech week is. Um, up to now, the actors, it's been all about the actors. Don't tell them it's not ever anything well, but. <laughs> but now it's bringing in the lights and the sound and whatnot, and, and it's, it's frustrating time because now they're to the point where they're ready to really, you know, go a step further into their acting, mm -hmm. but now we're going to draw back and it's going to be stopping for a light and trying out a sound and then wondering, is, is there a better song for this moment, <laughs> you know? And asking them to do a portion of a scene again and trying a different song. So it's, it becomes a, the technical part. So a little more start, show. stop, and, and look, perhaps trying, if they've kind of got in their mind, it's set a certain way. Yeah, and, and, and it'll, things will shift. And, mm -hmm. the, and the lights come in. And it's funny to think of a light being, like, it can, it can throw you when you're on stage because all of a sudden it's a, it's a bright light, mm -hmm. you know, and, you, and you're used to just rehearsal lights or it's, or it's going to be a, a lower light. And, and it just, everything, everything throws you as an actor. Mm -hmm. Everything is, it throws you at, at a certain point. And then you get used to it and then you love it. And so it's the best way to prepare for the, the opening. Oh, you exactly. have to. You have to. Yeah. You have to do yeah. this. Yeah. 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 Why don't you tell them a little bit about the story, though? I gave a oh, very, yeah. very <laughs> brief synopsis. It's, you know what? It's a perfect Valentine, you know, like a Valentine holiday piece. Mm -hmm. um, because it is the last romance that these people will have very likely in their lives, you know. And it, and it really is romance, and it takes place um, just about a week in their lives together. And it goes through, I don't want to give the story away particularly, um, but there, there are four roles in, the, in this play, and three of them are um, older people, and then there's a, a, younger, a younger male role. And... Um, He's kind of a surprising role, and I again, it's it's it, it's what it's all your it's things you left behind, you know, in your youth. Is it it's it's maybe a dream you once had, and someone starts to rekindle something in you. Um, it, it's really people who didn't know that they'd have certain feelings again mm -hmm. and 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 I guess everybody still has a teenager in them and for, for and the three adults yeah. have moments in this show that they're that they behave like teenagers they don't behave like your parents or grandparents <laughs> or how you think they should behave and I think that's what's fun about the show that if you want you know it's they can be very mature and they can also turn around in a moment and be very immature and, uh, and we have a dog in the show also. Yeah, and, and he's delightful. And he's great. He's, yeah. he's a seasoned actor. <laughs> <laughs> but no lines. No lines, but he's important. He's very important. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, this is his second appearance at a, in a play at Sandy, yeah. too. So he's it great. seems like a real throw of the dice to include an animal in a theater production. I, I, I'd better chime in on this one. <laughs> Last year we did, I, I directed a show and we had five dogs in it now. And one thing I've said afterwards, never again. <laughs> With five or just? <laughs> I'm not sure I want any dogs. <laughs> um, it, it was a challenge. Mm -hmm. It really is. Just keeping the animals focused. Well, yes, and keeping the owners focused too. I, I shouldn't say that. Did I? <laughs> it's on TV. <laughs> hey, whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> if they weren't used to having their animals in the theater space, it might be a new experience that they didn't grow well, accustomed it, to in it time. It was a challenge just yeah. to include everybody in that whole process. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just dealing with actors, we're dealing with uh, a lot of other variables. But right. it was great. The audience loved it. Oh, I bet. But then to keep it a little safer this year, we went to one dog. One dog, and, and, and 
he's a really good dog. You know? We had him in the show he last year too. He really is a good dog. Do you think he's going to brag to the other four dogs that didn't make that it? I got the role. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be my concern. <laughs> He did have a good tryout. So. Yeah. Well, I understand we have a few pictures from this. Um, if we could pull those up, we could take a look and perhaps get some feedback. That's a picture of us. Yeah, that's not the show. No, no. although I would, I'm willing to be the dog. Okay, so who do we have here? Oh, that's Jim and Lexi. Those are our leads. And they look great. The leads in Last Romance. Uh huh. Yes, and so their characters are. Um, let's see. I can't remember. <laughs> no, I can't. Well, Carol. Carol. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Ralph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that's their park bench. All right. There's the boy. That's the youngster. Ryan. Uh huh. Is he a hooligan or is he a good a good guy? He's quite surprising. He's a good guy. Good. Yeah. He, he he's actually the alter ego of. Yeah. Ralph, oh, many years before. Yeah. And then this is our fourth actor. That's right. And she plays Rose. And what and is her name? Rose. Oh, oh the actress. Mm -hmm. um, Berta Bert Limbaugh. Yeah. And she's on our board at Sandy, but she is the sister yes. in the play of Ralph. And you can see she day. really likes a lady. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> Does that she look had, she had to practice? She has uh, issues. Hmm? Did she have to practice the, the, the dour scowl? She did. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, good. she's not like that. She's really great. <laughs> but no pictures of the dog. But it's an adorable I dog. He did. He's great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you want to move on and talk a little bit about the, the Reader's Theater? Okay. Um, Reader's Theater is, has been going on for two and a half years now here in Gresham. It uh, started it pretty much a number of years ago. Before that, um, when Mount Hood Repertory was still um, in existence in um, Gresham, which was a great company that did summer shows um, directed or, and led by Tobias Anderson, who's a Gresham resident. But uh, because of various economic things, they did have to uh, discontinue for a while. They also did a Reader's Theater program during the year, though, um, during the regular like September through May time. And Reader's Theater is a unique experience if you've never seen it. It's, the emphasis is on the text. There are no, no costumes usually or, or props or it's usually, you know, stools and music stands. But it's amazing how well this all communicates to an audience. It's like listening to, you know, a, a radio program. We do full-length plays. People are not just reading. Mm -hmm. They're truly acting. We do have mm -hmm. rehearsal. Um, it's limited, but we usually have maybe three rehearsals, and I am quite impressed with what these actors can do. We do them once a month. It's on the third Monday of every month. We just had our first one of 2013 this past Monday, which was Neil Simon's Broadway Bound. Um, it takes place at the Gresham Chapel and Evening Events Center, which is on at 257 Southeast Roberts. Uh, we were very pleased, and we had a completely full house nice. this past Monday. <clears throat> um, and we had some really, really good comments on Great. the show. Is there music in Foley as well, or is it is just acting? No, it's, it's acting. Okay. Any usually, additional... usually we're, we're not doing sound effects or anything. It's left very much into the imagination of the audience. Uh, occasionally there may be a little bit of music if it has to be. Mm -hmm. We will have the director usually will read some stage directions if they have to be. But it's surprising how little has to be said and how much can commun be communicated mm -hmm. and experienced. Um, in this medium. In some ways it's, I wouldn't say it's better than an actual live performance, but it, it involves an audience in a very different way. We normally have had the pleasure of getting standing ovations afterwards. So. Great. Well, I would think that with the, uh, the extra imagination required to, to take it in, a person might feel 
more engaged at the end sometimes. Yes, I think that has something to do with it because again, like I said, the emphasis is just on listening to what the, the author wrote mm -hmm. and getting involved in that. So there's, in a, in a way, that's all you're experiencing, but it, it draws you in. Yep. What's the next production you're Our going to do? Our next one is The Trip to Bountiful, mm -hmm. which is a pretty well-known play by Horton Foote, and we, that will be February 18th. Again, it's Monday night at 7 p.m. We're privileged to have one of Portland's best-known actors in taking the lead of that, and that's Jane Fellows. She has been in a number of shows in the Portland area, plus um, done some things with us at Gre uh, in Gresham Inn in Sandy. Mm -hmm. okay, well, what's that story about a little bit, if you want to give me an elevator? Okay. Uh, Without giving away anything that's going to ruin it. Uh, mm -hmm. Carrie is an older lady who lives with her son and daughter-in-law, and she wants to return to her hometown of Bountiful. Um, just one last time to understand sort of where she came from and um, what is going on. She feels like, you know, if she can just do that, things will make sense again. And it's just her efforts to get back to that place. It's very much a memory play. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a well-received movie, made into a movie, and I believe it was in the 80s. With, uh, and Geraldine Page. Geraldine Page. I got. I knew the Geraldine, <laughs> and I was trying to um, won a, the Academy Award for Best Actress for the role. Was it called at the same time? Uh, yeah, it's called okay. the, the Trip to Bountiful. And when you see Jane, you would think she deserves one too. Is this some, a production that you've been wanting to do for a while? Because you're the you're the producer of, of this series. Um, well, I've been one of the. I wouldn't main persons that have instigated the series. You were series. The, the only one. Yeah. You were the leader. At first. At first. There's a number of people involved and we always need more people. Okay. As with any volunteer organization, it exists because people are willing to give their time. And they're passionate about yes, it. Yes, and it, it takes are. a lot of people to do something like this. To, uh, from the very beginning of reading plays and determining a season, making a publicity, uh, just getting the word out, it, it's an awful lot involved besides just, you know, you know, dealing with getting directors, casts, and all of that. And every, every month we're doing a different show, so mm -hmm. it's a continual process. Um, Trip to Bountiful actually was done in Portland uh, two or three years ago, and Jane was the lead in it. I did see it and uh, was pleased and impressed. We chose as our theme this year for Reader's Theater, Memories and Dreams, so it fit very well. Oh, perfect. So every year has got sort of a, yes. an umbrella that you're working under uh, thematically. Mm -hmm. Well, great. So we've got the, the last performance directed by you coming up, and then we have the trip to the romance. What did I say? Performance. Performance. <laughs> it's not a performance yet, but <laughs> <laughs> well, what you said, <laughs> the last <laughs> romance. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you, Tim and Daylene, for coming in and sharing what you guys are up to. Really appreciate it. And I want to thank everybody for viewing and watching Community Hotline here for Metro East Cable Access. Cable Access? I can't even say.
Mm-hmm.